Okay, so um, this is lecture four, and today in lecture we're going to be talking about deep time and the biological revolution. So I got a question last time after lecture um, about what it is we're actually doing in this course. People are a little bit surprised that um, you know it's it's turning. It, it sort of seems like it's a little bit of a history lesson slash chemistry class as opposed to uh, a physics class about the the origin of life in the universe. And so I wanted to sort of explain a little bit um, about what the philosophy I have in this course is and what we're really trying to do. So, so first of all, the subject, I mentioned this before, but the subject is pretty broad, right? So if you want to talk about is there life elsewhere in the universe, you need to understand a lot of basic science for many different fields. So you've got to understand about something about biology, something about the geology, astronomy, basic physics. Etc. And so there's a lot of stuff to cover. And so what we're going to be doing is, especially in the beginning of the course, we're going to be sort of a broad sampling, almost a dusting of a lot of these fields to sort of get a sense of what they're about. But also, you know, the, in telling these stories about the origin of these fields, um, there's a method there. So not only is, I, I think, some, many of these stories are, are just fundamentally interesting things, but what we're trying to do here is, I, give some sense of, of why it is we know these things, right? So rather than this course being about, I'm just going to tell you everything we know about the planets and everything we know about the Earth and everything we know about life today, that's sort of interesting, but that's basically just like a list of facts. And if you wanted to know that, you could just Google it, right? It wouldn't be that hard to know those facts. What we really want to do here is to develop some kind of understanding of how we came to know these things and how the scientific method works. And I think a really useful way of sort of dipping your toe into that is to go through the history. Because historically, you can see how people are grappling with these problems and how breakthroughs occur. And that's what we're kind of trying to do here. So in the first part of this course, that's why there's sort of so much history. The idea is to focus on the methods that they're using and not so much the names of the scientists and exactly what the date was. I'm going to give you that because it's important to have context here. But fundamentally, I'm interested in the methodology these people were using and how things are transitioning from one basic idea to another and how hard that is to sort of break out of other molds. Okay, so that's sort of the point. So the first part of this lecture is going to be sort of continue what we were talking about last time and be focused on the antiquity of the Earth. So the fact now we know the Earth is very, very old, but how did we come to sort of realize that? Um, we talked about last time that understanding that the Earth has an age presupposes the idea that the Earth actually has a beginning. And so you have to sort of grapple with that idea individually in order to even ask the question, right? So, um, and as I mentioned, there are a lot of age estimates for the Earth that give you an age for the Earth of about 6,000 years. But these are primarily historically based estimates. That is, because it's historical, it's fundamentally meaning that you're relying on written records and to some extent oral history of human beings. So the fact that a lot of different sources derived an age for the Earth of something like 6,000 years um, is not that surprising given that all of those methods presuppose the idea that humans have been around the whole time the Earth has been around. And if that is your assumption, you're pretty much going to get 6,000 years, more or less, because you get 4,000 years. You, you basically go back to the time of the written, the written record, and you're going to get 6,000 years. Um, now, the problem with that is, is that if you rely on other assumptions, you start getting lots of different answers. And so um, as you start to look at physical sort of tracers for the age of the Earth, the age of the Earth suddenly blows up. Uh, so many geological discoveries eventually uncovered the fact that the Earth is apparently extremely old, much, much older than 6,000 years, older than 100,000 years. In fact, now we think it's older than many billions of years. And today, we actually have an incredibly precise uh, estimate of the age of the Earth at 4.54 plus or minus 0.05 billion years. So it's amazing how precise we have age dated the Earth. And I'll talk a bit about those methods sort of towards the end. But basically, we do that by having radiometric age dating, that is, relying on radioactive substances and measuring sort of what's the, the daughter products of those substances and, and using that to back out the age of these rocks in much the same way the example we gave last time about the beer foam 
falling down with a certain rate. You can estimate when your beer was poured by if, uh, measuring sort of how much the foam has fallen over time. So I mentioned this before, but you know, remarkably now we have this age of the Earth that's 4.57 billion years. And the antiquity of the Earth scientifically is pretty firmly established. Now you might you know, quibble with this uncertainty of 0.05 billion years, maybe it's 0.1 billion years, but no one really is going to argue that the Earth is younger than 4 billion years. I mean, people will argue that, but no one's going to be able to provide evidence, this sort of strong evidence to rule that out. Yeah? How do we know it's not just the age of the universe? Well, I'm just, well, it could be. I mean, given everything we know, right, if you just focus on the Earth, the whole universe could have come into existence 4.5 billion years ago, exactly when the Earth came into existence. Um, however, other pieces of evidence suggest that that's not true. Um, and uh, so, for example, um, I'll, as we'll talk a little bit about later, we understand now how stars evolve with time. So we know how stars of different luminosities and colors change as a function of time. And based on our sort of physics understanding of those stars, we can age date many, many stars in our galaxy to ages much older than 4 billion years. So <clears throat> now we believe that there are stars in our galaxy that are older than 10 billion years. <clears throat> so if you believe that astronomical constraint, we sort of have evidence of substances in our own galaxy that are much, much older than the age of the Earth. Moreover, if you sort of then start looking at cosmological constraints on the age of the universe, by looking at even more distant galaxies and by studying something called the cosmic microwave background, um, we have a pretty precise age date for when we think the universe actually began, and that's at something like 13.7 uh, or 13.8 billion years. Um, so it comes from lots of different places. But if we're just focusing on the Earth, you know, we haven't talked about much beyond that. This is sort of, a, a sort of an absolute lower limit on the age of the universe. You would think the universe has to be older than the Earth. Is that, is that reasonable? Yeah? Are they assuming that the Earth, like in its current size right now, is that, are they assuming that it, when it began, like 4.5 billion years ago, that it yeah. was that size? Or are they thinking that maybe there was like some other thing and then yeah. another that's a great idea. That's a great point, and I'll, we'll return to this. And it, so the question was, when people make these age estimates, are they they're seeing this age as like the Earth is exactly as big as it is now, or did something else happen since that time? So the point of this is that there was some event. There are rocks on the Earth that have ended up on the Earth that were last liquefied in sort of a magma type form four and a half billion years ago that have settled on the Earth. Now, the understanding of that is that in the very early stages of the Earth, it, when it was sort of being formed, it was basically a, um, what, ha what was happening is lots of rocks were beginning to sort of pile up together and be attracted by gravity. And in the very early period, there were all, all kinds of bombardments of the early Earth by like meteors and, and large rocks that were floating around the solar system. And at some point, it sort of you know, coagulated into something that was fairly massive roughly the mass of the Earth today, probably a, maybe a little bit lighter than the Earth today. And um, that's sort of what we're talking about as the beginning. So it's actually a little bit, you know, in, in terms of what that object actually looked like, we're not exactly sure, but we think it was something roughly the size of the Earth today. Then we think after this point, a, a pretty large thing slammed into the Earth, something that was roughly the size of Mars, and a piece of the Earth basically broke off and that became the moon. And so that formation of the moon and that big, huge event that we think happened um, sometime after this uh, would have totally rattled the nature of the Earth. Um, and things would have changed a bit from then. But we'll get to that in a little later. But that's a very good, that's a very, very good question. Are there other questions? OK. So let me remind you, we talked a little bit about this last time. But there were these early uh, sort of uh, attempts to provide some kind of physical argument for the age of the Earth. And it's, it's useful to sort of run through these ideas, because again, this is where the ideas that people were grappling with at the time. So this is roughly in the 1700s. So in 1715, Edmund Haley, the Haley's Comet Haley, uh, basically was using the oceans as you can think of as a salt clock. Okay, so the idea was that the oceans started off perfectly fresh water. And we know over time the rivers are dumping salts into the ocean. And so what he was assuming was, well, if we assume the oceans start off perfectly fresh, 
I can measure the rate at which salts are being dumped into the ocean by the, by the rivers. What age of the Earth do I, do I get if I allow this process to happen until we reach the current salinity of the ocean? Uh, and if you did this, you got something like 100 million years. Okay? So that's interesting. Um, the problem was with his assumption. It turns out that um, it's not necessarily obvious that the earliest oceans were perfectly fresh water. I mean, they, they probably were, but they may not have been. But also, salts are added and removed to the oceans both. So they're also removed from the oceans via different processes. So um, it turns out that this isn't, isn't the best way to age date uh, the Earth. But it, yet, you know, again, it's a useful idea. And it's interesting to sort of run through these numbers. Another idea is people had, for a while, thought about the idea that the Earth started off as molten. This was something that had sort of percolated in the, in the consciousness of scientists. And uh, you had some estimate of how hot the Earth had to be in order to, for it to be sort of in liquid form. And then you, you calculated how long it would take to just sort of passively cool off from that hot state. And so at this time, people were beginning to understand things like thermodynamics sort of the sort of early stages of understanding that physics. And so people started to estimate these numbers. Leclerc got something of like 100,000 years. And he was doing experiments by basically heating up balls of material and seeing how long it took for them to cool and that kind of thing. One of the basic assumptions here, and by the way, the physics behind this is when something cools off, smaller things cool off faster than big things. And the reason why is that you lose your heat from your surface. And if you remember that little experiment, that, that little discussion about volumes versus areas, OK? If you imagine a sphere, right, that's some size, the surface area of a sphere goes like its radius squared. But the volume of that sphere goes like the radius cubed, OK? So if you have a, a sphere and it's small, it has lots of surface area compared to, compared to its mass. So it stores all its heat and its volume. You know, that's how much ener you know, sort of heat energy it's got stored there. But it's radiating that heat out over its volume. But if you took this, a sphere of exactly the same temperature and made it much, much bigger, it's going to take longer for that sphere to radiate its heat away because its surface area is smaller compared to its mass. This is basically the reason why big people are hotter than small people. Okay, so like, you, if you go, or animals, like look at animals who are living in really cold environments, they'll oftentimes be really big, right? And that's because they're shedding less heat. Okay, so my wife and I are constantly arguing about how cold it is or how hot it is in the room because I'm a little bit bigger than her and I just stay hotter than her. Uh, she gets colder uh, faster than me. So, and I know why, I understand, it doesn't help the argument at all, but I understand why it doesn't help. Uh, so anyway, that's the basic physics here, and that's what they were thinking about. They had some idea of how big the Earth was, and they were thinking about this cooling period. In 1862, this num these numbers were revised by Lord Kelvin. So this is the guy who's the Kelvin temperature scale is named after, uh, to get something closer to 100,000 years. He was a great physicist and sort of was doing the calculation a bit better and was getting something like 100 million years for the age of the Earth. Turns out he was also doing it wrong. Um, one of the f primary things is people at this point did not understand that there was such a thing as radioactivity. There are elements in the Earth that are just decaying radioactively, and that's pumping heat into the Earth, and that's keeping it hotter than it would be otherwise. And so he underestimated how long, how old the Earth was because it's hotter than it would have been otherwise if it was, didn't have this heat source. Also, he assumed that the core of the Earth was solid and not liquid, and that's another problem that he had. So he had a number of assumptions in his model about the nature of the Earth that got uh, him the wrong answer. Interestingly, Lord Kelvin, as I'll, I'll talk about Darwin later in this lecture, but Lord Kelvin was a contemporary of Darwin. And Darwin wanted an Earth that was older than this in order for his ideas about natural selection to work. And Lord Kelvin was sort of sort of trashed Darwin's ideas that the Earth could be older than about 100 million years because he had a lot of different independent, his own estimates for the age of the Earth that put it at something like 100 million years and not several hundred million years, which is sort of what Darwin was arguing he needed to, to sort of explain the diversity of species by natural selection. But it turns out that, that Kelvin was, Kelvin was fundament, fundamentally lim limited by physics that he didn't know. There was physics that's been discovered since the time of Lord Kelvin that sort of thrown a wrench into all of his sort of basic arguments for the age of the Earth. Anyway, um, 
<coughs> a next big player in sort of people trying to figure out the history of the, the age of the Earth is a guy named James, Hut James Hutton, who around the year 1800 published this very important book called Theory of the Earth. Um, he introduced this idea. So in the past, people had sort of had this vague notion that if you looked at strata on Earth, the oldest layers were laid down first, and then the slightly older layers came on top of that. But he introduced this idea that um, actually over geological history, things could be repaired. So if you had you know, ridges or something that were created, this stuff could be filled in by slow acting processes like erosion, et cetera. Now, the previous ideas that people sort of had dominated these discussions was the idea the Earth was born in some way, and since that time, it had only been eroding away. It's sort of, sort of born in some form and then decaying thereafter. Uh, but he pushed this idea that that wasn't really true, that there were, there were sort of upheavals in the history of the Earth. And this made things hard to, you know, from his point of view, it made things very hard to age date the Earth because you can imagine the surface of the Earth being turned over by various processes over time. Um, so he concluded the Earth was definitely millions of years old, okay, but he asserted that the cycle of decay and repair erased much, much of the Earth's history and said, therefore, it's going to be really hard to use geology to age date the Earth. So for example, you know, this is just a sketch of this. And so this is some younger period in Earth's history, more recent period in Earth's history. And there are sort of these, these sort of strata laid down over time, over eons. But some catastrophic event happened in the past, right, that created, that made sediments that were laying like this tilt up on their sides. So maybe there was an earthquake, or mountains were, were growing for one reason or another. Um, they didn't really understand tectonic shifting at the time, but you know, he was sort of making the point that things get kind of messed up sometimes as you go down, and it get, makes it harder to sort of read, tick this history off in a very simple way. But then in around 1830, a fellow by the name of Charles Lyell uh, introduced sort of improved methods for sort of taking care of these problems. Okay. Um, and he made the point that strata of different rocks can be separate, can separate the ages of previous geological history. And you could do this by, by matching fossils at different points. So, you know, he was making, so by the way, I should back, I should back up. One of the points he made, which is sort of fundamentally interesting and influenced scientists after him, was that old rocks, if you dig down, old rocks actually look a lot like young rocks. Term, you know, rock, a rock's a rock. Um, but if you look at fossils, you see things change as you dig deeper. And so while all rocks are alike, life shows a great variation with time as you sort of dig down. And so what he was saying was, well, OK, this is interesting in and of itself. But also, if you want to age date some rocks, OK, if you find a certain type of fossil in these rocks, and you can age date them with that same fossil in some other, maybe say, deeper uh, section of rock. And then you would say, oh, well, these should actually be matched up. So there was some, something that made the rocks do this, but I could just sort of bring them back this way by, age, by matching up fossils. And so the idea is something like this, that you know, you've got these two sections of rock that are sort of, or of the earth that are sort of separated in some way, OK? Um, and they're not at the same height, and some you know, catastrophic thing has happened to sort of bring them out of whack. But uh, if you have sort of types of fossils here that you can date in some way, and you find those same types of fossils over here, you could then sort of play this game of sort of lining them up. And you say, oh, OK, well, these rocks and these rocks were sort of laid down at the same time, formed at the same time. And we began to sort of like normalize you know, different sections of the Earth. So in some parts of the Earth, the surface of the Earth is older than others, for example. And you can try to use this as a way of, of, of uh, matching this up. Are there questions about this basic idea? I'm kind of running through this quickly, but just sort of give you a sense of the kind of questions people are grappling with. OK. So how do we do this today? So let's say we actually wanted to know, well, in a modern sense, what the age of this fossil was. How would we do it? Well, 
what's done these days is we, we use radioactive uh, dating. And we introduced this already, but let's just remind ourselves of what's going on here. <clears throat> there are certain isotopes uh, that, of elements that are not stable. Okay? They're created uh, via processes that can actually generate new chemical elements. And then these elements, once created, uh, can decay if they're, if, if they're an isotope of one kind or another. So one example of that is the isotope of carbon called carbon-14. So carbon-14 has a half-life, meaning that if you start out with 100 carbon atoms and you wait some time, once you go one half-life, once you wait one half-life, you only have 50 carbon atoms. And then if you wait another half-life, you only have 25 carbon atoms, et cetera. And so every half-life, you go down by a factor of two. That's, that's the idea of half-life decay. Um, so carbon-14 is an interesting one. It has a half-life of 5,730 years. Now, most of the carbon in the atmosphere is not carbon-14. It's carbon-12. But a tiny trace amount of the carbon in the atmosphere is this uh, unstable carbon-14 stuff that decays, that every 5,730 years, half of it will decay. It decays into nitrogen-14, okay? So imagine that you're an animal or a plant that's living, you know, you're, you're breathing in that carbon, say. So you're an animal, you're breathing in that carbon. That carbon's being incorporated into you some way. Or you're a plant, uh, sorry, did I say animal breathing in carbon? If you're a plant and you're breathing in carbon dioxide, you're incorporating that carbon into your, uh, into your into your body, into the makeup of the plant. And that fraction, the, the fraction of carbon-14 that's in the atmosphere gets kind of fixed. It gets locked in to the carbon that makes, that makes you up, that makes up this plant, okay? Then the plant dies. At that point, it stops having, it stops taking in the carbon-14 that's alive in it, that's sort of fresh in the atmosphere. And the carbon-14 starts to decay away. So if you have some plant at some point, it dies sometime in the past, it will have a bunch of carbon-14 atoms. But if you wait a half-life, half of those carbon-14 atoms will now have decayed into nitrogen-14. If you wait another half-life, another half of those will decay into carbon-14. And so if you could go back and, and if you go and see a pile of this plant matter, okay, this formal, former plant matter, that you find, and if you go out and measure how much carbon-14 it has, you can then get an estimate of how, fat, how quickly it's been, uh, how long it's been since it was alive. Now, in order to do that, okay, you have to have some reasonable estimate of how much, what the proportion of carbon-14 to regular carbon was when it was alive. And to first order, you could just assume it was the same as what we see in the atmosphere today. But it turns out that number varies a little bit. You can, turns out you can fix that if you, for example, use t, uh, tree rings. Tree rings is a way where people count rings so you know how many years back you're going. And then you can make a pretty good estimate of what the carbon-14 uh, estimate was in the atmosphere, say, going back to about 10,000 years. And there's other methods to sort of normalize these techniques. But the basic idea is you're relying on the fact that you have a clock. Um, the clock is one that ticks every 5,730 years. If you have a precise enough measurement, you can then age date stuff back. It turns out sort of 50,000 years you can use this to sort of age date stuff, and perhaps even a little bit longer. But fundamentally what you're relying on is usually it's some kind of organic matter uh, that's been uh, fixing carbon. Are there questions about this? If people have questions about this, please ask, okay? Did that go by too fast? Or are we good? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So the question was, well, that only goes up to like 50,000 years. You just told me the Earth is 4 billion years old, so how you get from there to there? That's, that's hard for me to understand. Fortunately, there's other isotopes. Okay? So we have a great toolbox of isotopes, and they all run with different clocks. They all have many different sort of these decay time clocks. Some of them are 5,000-year clocks, some of them are 10,000-year clocks, and some of them are billion-year clocks. And so it's these long ticking clocks that tend to be the most useful things for age dating the Earth itself. Uh, for example, uranium isotopes 
are uh, radioactive, and they eventually decay. Um, in particular, there's something called the uranium lead method for age dating rocks. Um, that's particularly important for zircon crystals. And zircon crystals tend to be the things that are used to get the most ancient dates for the age of the Earth. So there are two uranium isotopes, uranium-238 and uranium-235, that decay. And they decay at different rates. All right. Um, by the way, uh, uranium-235 is the stuff that people call enriched uranium. Okay, So it's uranium-235. That's the stuff that's used in bombs. And so when people talk about uri enriching uranium, there's only a teeny tiny fraction of the uranium on Earth is this stuff. Um, and usually when you get a bunch of uranium, most of it's this stuff. And so what you do is you try to mine out this, get this stuff. Okay. Uh, and notice that the reason why this is fundamentally is uranium-235 decays faster than uranium-238. So at some point in the early universe, Uranium was created probably in some kind of catastrophic explosion associated with a massive star's death. And a bunch of uranium was created. But that uranium start decaying. Uranium-235 start decaying faster than uranium-238. And so most of the stuff that's left on Earth is, is mostly the 238 stuff and not the 235 stuff. OK, that's an aside. But anyway, both these kinds of uranium are decaying. Um, the way it decays is it goes from uranium-238 to lead-206 or uranium-235 to lead-207. Both of those types of lead are stable. So as soon as that decay happens, it just sticks as lead. All right. But the important thing is, is the half-lives are really long. So this is 4.5 giga years. A giga is 10 to the 9, so it's 4.5 billion years. And this one is about 700 million years. So you've got now two separate clocks in principle. And they both have sort of these long lifetimes. All right. Now, when you form zircon in, out of some molten process, when zircon crystals are formed, it turns out that rejects lead. So when zircon crystals are originally formed, they don't like to form with lead. They like to form with uranium. And so if you have a newly formed zircon crystal, they'll basically leave no lead in it. They'll just be uranium. All right. But as time goes on, right, the uranium-238 eventually turns into lead-206, and the uranium-235 will turn into lead-207, but at different rates. Okay. So as time goes on, the ratio of the 206 lead to the 238 uranium increases. And so does the 207 lead versus 235 uranium, but they increase at different rates. So now you've got something, you've got sort of two clocks going off. And now if you can go and find a zircon crystal and measure how much of each of uranium-238, 235, lead-206, lead-207, you've got sort of two handles on the potential age of this thing. All right, so again, if you start with a bunch of uranium-235, over time, that uranium-235 will decay away, and you'll just end up with lead. So imagine you formed a zircon crystal two and a half giga years ago, two and a half billion years ago, and it would be made up of uranium-238 and uranium-235 with no lead, no corresponding lead at all. But if you waited till today, then you'd have something like this left, right? <clears throat> Roughly half of the uranium-238 would be left, because that's the half-life of that uranium-238. But almost none of the uranium-235 would be left, because it's decaying more quickly. Remember, this is the stuff that's super rare that we enrich to get. OK, questions about this? So the point is that if you could get a zircon crystal and via sort of laboratory techniques measure the ratio of lead 206 to 238 and measure the ratio of lead 207 to uh, uranium 235, those ratios should march along this pink curve. And where you are on this curve corresponds to the age of the crystal. 
Um, you mean from the, the diff, if they're born with different ratios of 238 and 235? That's the beauty of this method. It doesn't matter. Because the only thing you want to know is the ratio of lead 206 to, to two, uranium 238. So this axis is independent of how much uranium 235 you started with. So it could have started 50-50, it could have started 90-10. You know, it doesn't matter because the only thing you're making ratios of are the lead and the uranium. You're not doing uranium to uranium. And that's why this, you know, that's somewhat different than the carbon one. This makes this even more powerful and more precise than the carbon one. See what I mean? Yeah, great question. Do people understand that? That in order to like, so the point is you go make a measurement, right? I can measure some value of this ratio and a measure of some value of this ratio, and I put it on my plot. And presumably, it's going to lie on that pink line. Okay. Now, the beauty of that is I don't have to know how much lead 230 or how much uranium 238 start we started with versus uranium 235. It doesn't matter. I could have started 50-50, right? I can make zircon out of enriched uranium, in principle, and it would, you would still lie on this curve. Now, uh, it raises another issue is if you make that measurement, it won't have to necessarily lie on that curve. And if it doesn't, then you know you've screwed something up. And you might distrust the number you get out. Because it kind of has to lie on perfectly on this curve. If it sits here, you're like, well, I screwed something up. This doesn't make any sense. But that's good, right? So it's like a double check of your method. But at some level, it's the fact that there are all these double checks with these kind of methods is why people are so confident in their age dating of rocks. Because there's so many different ways. There's so many ways to get it wrong, and you're not getting it wrong in those ways. Does that make sense? Um, the, the cool thing about these methods is they're so well refined that you can actually use them to age date things that span huge ranges from two million years to two and a half, you know, sorry. Uh, you can get, sorry, you can get error bars, that is uncertainties in age estimates that are as small as two million years over a measurement that's more than a billion years. That is, that's why those error bars are so small. That's why it was 4.5, you know, 4 plus or minus 0.05 as the age of the Earth. That error is so small because of these sort of, there's so many double checks in this method. And so just by the way, you know, so you brought up, you got your 5,000 year clock for carbon. Now you got your four gig a year to one gig a year clock from uranium. What about stuff in between? But fortunately, there's all kinds of stuff that's in between. I mean, it's super long half-life things that are 100 billion years. Uh, but there's things that are more like 1 billion year. For example, this particular type of potassium is potassium 20 or potassium 40. Um, and so if you have substances that are made of all of these different types of elements, you can then use these things to sort of, again, get more precise ages. Um, and by the way, but I mentioned this before, but I sort of brought this back in that, you know, Bananas have some radioactive potassium in them. And there's about 14 decays every second in a banana. So if you had a banana and you had a Geiger counter, you, could, you would go off around your banana. So basically the way this works is um, what you're dating when you measure the age of one of these rocks is the time when it's solidified. And this sort of goes back to your question about like what was the Earth, what are you talking about as the origin of the Earth? What did it look like then? So what you're age dating these rocks is when the thing solidified, when it's sort of crystallized out, okay? Um, when it solidifies, that's when these chemically allowed elements are locked in. So when the zirconium's forming, it locks in the uranium, it, it, does, it sort of keeps the lead out. And so those daughter products, like the lead, sort of get put there when the thing decays. And now you have this weird zircon crystal that's got lead in it. Like, how did that get there? Well, it got there because the uranium it formed from turned into lead, right? So your sort of alchemy is happening, right? You're changing elements into each other, but the universe does it for us. You don't need an alchemist to do it. 
Um, now, when the mineral gets melted again, that whole thing is reset. That whole process gets reset again. So you're only seeing, you know, when you age date these rocks, you're only seeing when they sort of cool out and become solid. Now, something that's, you know, we sort of mentioned a little bit before, but now it's pretty uniformly recognized that the Earth is geologically active. So that means it's melting, you know, rock is being melted and recreated all the time. And in fact, most of the crust of the Earth that you're standing on is about 100 million years old. Okay, so if you think about it compared to the age of the Earth, that's pretty young. Um, and so in order to find the oldest rocks, you have to really hunt hard for them. Most, what that, and the other way to think about that is that most of the surface rocks on the Earth have been melted and recreated and melted and recreated many times over the history of the Earth. So we have an active, geologically active planet. And it turns out that a geologically active planet is good. If you want to have life, we'll return to this later, but if you want to have life on your planet, we think that geological activity is important and good for life. There are planets in our solar system that are not geologically active. The world's oldest rocks sort of range, or here are some examples of some of the world's oldest rocks, and there are others, but there are, you know, there are places in the, you know, sort of there, there, there are places you can go, you know, most of these places are sort of universities where they have these little samples of these ancient rocks, and if you know the right person, you can hold them in your hand, you know, you can hold rocks that are four billion years old in your hand. Um, the Jack Hills of Australia, I think, is the current record holder, at least close to the record holder, has a zircon crystal of about 4.4 billion years. Um, there's areas in Canada that have these sort of ancient rocks that you can find. Um, and there's some places in Greenland that have very, very old rocks. And there are other places on Earth where the surface is extremely young, even much younger than 100 million years. And so you, know, you have to know where to go and to get a sense of where to hunt for these old rocks. Here's an image of one of these really ancient rocks this zircon crystal. Uh, it looks big, but it's not, unfortunately. It's not like really big and awesome looking. It's basically the si it's twice the width of a hair. So it's a teeny tiny little thing. Um, this zircon crystal, we think, basically <coughs> formed when uh, about a, within 100 million years of when we think the actual Earth solidifying process was first happening. Um, Now, what this means is that probably a lot of the Earth was molten 4.4 billion years ago. So this is when these things were first crystallizing out. So this gives you a sense of when the Earth was first molten. And we don't think the Earth was, you know, you're not going to have life probably on a molten planet. Um, but pretty soon after that, it cooled down. And one of the big questions is, how long did it take from the point when the Earth sort of got cool to when we first have evidence for the emergence of life? Because if that process was fast, you know, that means life just gets going whenever, the, you know, whenever you give it the right conditions. It just happens quickly. But you could imagine a scenario where you have first evidence for life you know, 2 billion years later. If it takes 2 billion years for life to get going, then you might think, wow, you know, that's kind of a long time. And what if it was sort of rare? You know, then you could see life being pretty rare in the universe. And so one of the questions we're going to discuss later is when did life first emerge? And what's the evidence for that? So the current estimates for what we think was going on is there is this sort of very early formation period in the Earth that we think was something like 4.5-ish billion years ago. This Jack Hill zircon was a little bit after that, 4.4 billion years. And sometime around this time, too, is when this sort of event that we think formed the moon happened. So it was sort of around, all sort of happening around this same period. Um, this whole epoch was called the Hadean era, and I'll return to this later, but it's called the Hadean because it was, very, it was basically hellish. Like There was stuff just slamming onto the Earth all the time. Big rocks were sort of all throughout the solar system, hitting the planets, vaporizing them, making them molten again. So if you've heard this story about a big impact killed the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago, you've heard of this? 
Um, we'll talk about that later. But those kind of impacts were happening like all the time at this point. It was just like bam, bam. And so it was this crazy period where things were going crazy. Um, but then sort of as soon as that period settled down, we begin to find evidence for the emergence of life on Earth. Um, the first, you know, the first real big rise, you know, huge jump in the atmospheric oxygen, like oxygen being created in the atmosphere on the Earth, by the way, didn't happen for another couple billion years. So most of the life that was going on, you know, the early life on Earth was happening within the oceans. And it was only much, much later that you begin to see life on land and more complex things happening. And that's a story we'll, we'll tell later. But just in terms of the time frame, right? Here are the dinosaurs, way at this end. So a lot of us sort of having this idea like, oh, way back in the day when the dinosaurs were roaming the Earth. But if you look at the, you know, the history of the Earth, even the dinosaurs were pretty recent. And then, you know, we are just like now. Like, you know, humans have been around about 100,000 years. That, that's nothing. So it took a very long time to get to the point where you have sort of walking lizards on the land. Most of the history of the Earth is teeny tiny little life. That's about all you've got. So how did we get to this point where we began to understand the rise of life and what is life is? What's the story of this? And that's where we're going to go now. Um, for lack of a better term, we're going to call this the biological revolution. Okay. Um, and what we're going to talk about is the fact that for a very long time, when people thought about biology and just the origin of life itself, right, which is one of the key questions of this course, people had this idea that life could be spontaneously generated. Okay. Um, and I'll return to this idea a little later, but you know, the basic, it's not such a crazy idea, right? If you have mud and goopy stuff, at some point you come back and there's flies crawling on it, right? If you, if you leave some trash outside your house, you know, the next thing you know, there's some maggots. You know, it just sort of looks like, where did they come from? They, they, they emerge from this putrefying stuff. Okay, and so this idea that life could basically sort of spontaneously generate out of mud and goop um, is something that's been with people for a very long time. Um, we now, of course, no longer believe that this is true. And a big step in this direction to figure this out was the invention of the microscope. Much like the invention of the telescope sort of changed the way we see the universe when we look out, the invention of that, a very similar technology of manipulating lenses and therefore manipulating light allowed us to see things that were too small to ever before have been seen and that revealed to us that on very small scales, stuff is alive. There's little things alive in water, for example, that you never knew was there. Um, eventually, as technology got better, people began to understand the origin of heredity um, and how that links fundamentally into, into how life works. And eventually, the understanding of genes and DNA gets us close to the modern era. And I'm going to touch on this at the very end of the lecture, I think, if I have time. But we're going to return to this again uh, a little bit later in the course. This is just sort of a touching sort of introduction to the, the ideas. So as I mentioned before, this idea of spontaneous generation has been with us a very long time. Surprise, surprise, it comes, you know, we've, our first recorded instance of talking about this idea comes to us from our old friend Aristotle, who again had it wrong, uh, even though he was smart. Um, so the idea is that animals spontaneously emerge from putrefying earth um, and veg or vegetable matter. And like I mentioned, you know, this isn't a crazy idea. Okay, you take a piece of raw meat and you throw it outside. The next thing you knew, next thing you know, you got flies and maggots all over the thing. And for, you know, all you knew, it just, they came from it. You know, they were sort of born of this, this sort of rotting meat. Um, you can see this even in, in writing that, that goes through to the Renaissance. Like this is a quote from Antony and Cleopatra from Shakespeare. Your serpent of Egypt is bred now of your mud by the operation of your son. So is your crocodile. So what they're talking about here is you've got the mud of the Nile that's, that's generating the sort of the source of life that's generating all these, these things, right? This is a very common idea that actually stayed with us until not, not that long ago. Um, 
Now, one of the first people to <coughs> try to argue against this idea of spontaneous generation is this fellow here, uh, Francesco Reddy. Now, he was actually doing an experiment, okay? So these are early days of, of science where you could do pretty basic experiments and get a lot, you know, get a lot of mileage out of it. But it's important to sort of back up and talk about these basic things. This is, this is sort of, this is the essence of what science is. So what did he do? Well, he took a jar. In fact, he took another jar. And he had some meat. And he put meat in an open jar, right? Then he put meat uh, in a tightly sealed jar. And then he got a third jar and put some meat in it and just put some gauze over the jar and waited. As you might expect, uh, living you know, in 17th century Europe, you're going to get maggots and putrefying meat. It's sort of like my picture of 17th century Europe is just, like, just maggots and putrefying meat everywhere. Uh, but so he has his open jar, comes back. There's like maggots crawling all over the thing. Um, but no maggots in the tightly sealed jar and no maggots in the covered jar, right? And what he said is, look, the flies go down and eat some of the meat. They hang around the meat. At some point, they make new flies. Those are the maggots. But the flies that can't get into the meat, they don't make maggots. So flies beget maggots, okay, which develop into flies, which develop new maggots, which develop into flies. Those maggots are not spontaneously generated from putrefying meat. Okay? Now, that seems so obvious to us, right? But people didn't know this. Like, how would you know? And so he does a very simple experiment to make the argument. Not so fast, right? But this idea of spontaneously gener spontaneous generation lasted longer, right? So people said, well, okay, fine with the maggots and the flies. Yeah, that, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a little smaller stuff. Um, so this guy, Felix Pouchet, did a very famous experiment where he took some hay and boiled it. I'm going to kill all the life on the hay. I'm going to boil it, okay? Then he exposed... Uh, this hay to oxygen. And he got the oxygen by basically uh, splitting water. So he had understood, at this point, people had, under remember, it, by this time, people had understood that this stuff, this oxygen existed in the air, and this is the stuff that facilitated life. And they even understand how to make it by running a current through water. And they could, they could make, they could break water up into its hydrogen and oxygen. And then he just put oxygen, he exposed this hay to oxygen. No outside air, no outside flies, nothing else, right? So it's just pure oxygen and boiled hay. What happened? Okay? Microorganisms soon appeared on the hay. So he concluded that spontaneously generation, spontaneous generation of microorganisms happened on that, on that hay because he didn't let anything from the outside in. Now his problem was is he didn't understand that there, were heat, there was heat resistant life. Okay? There's heat resistant spores that he just did not boil that hay at a high enough temperature to kill it. And so uh, it wasn't spontaneously generated, but for his point of view, it seemed that way. It was Louis Pasteur who really understood how to kill microbial life, right? That's where we get pasteurization. And so he did sort of a very fundamental experiment by understanding really how to just kill life completely, you know, boil it to the temperatures required. Um, and the sort of famous experiment that he did is he had these special uh, flasks with very long necks, okay? And um, uh, he had a broth. One broth was boiled at sort of Pasteur level boiling to kill everything, and the other broth. Uh, was uh, just sort of unboiled, okay? Um, now the point is, these very precisely created flasks could let in air, but they could not let in airborne yeast. So yeast being the thing that beget fermentation, okay? What he found is that the broth, the, un the boiled broth did not uh, ferment, and the unboiled broth did almost right away. Then he took this thing and broke off the neck of the, of the flask and almost immediately uh, the boiled broth started to ferment. 
So his point was that there's some microscopic things that are getting in there that's causing this fermentation and this life is not just being spontaneously generated, but it's sort of growing there because it's, uh, it has to be sort of transported there through the air. Other questions about this? Now, of course, the real big breakthrough, we talked about this before, was the invention of the microscope, right? Because the microscope now allows you to step away from doing these sort of crude experiments, which were important, but really sort of seeing things that your eyes could not see, readily see, right? Uh, and Leeuwenhoek is the, the per, sort of the Galileo of biology, right, who is, who is doing this kind of thing. And what this thing did is it allowed us to see the small details of tiny animals and the small details of larger animals and plants in a way that had never been seen before. Okay? The discovery of cells, the discovery that your skin is actually made up of individual cells. Plants are made up of individual cells. This is a fundamental thing, right? This, people had no idea that this was the case. Okay? The discovery of microorganisms. Okay? Here's some water. Oh boy, I've been drinking this water my whole life. I wonder what it looks like under a microscope. Ah, okay. <laughs> right? Imagine the water they, this was, see, this is before people were drinking clean water. People didn't understand that like diseases were carried in water. They didn't know all that stuff, right? So they, they were drinking the same water that they were pooping in basically, right? And they didn't know that, that was bad. And then suddenly they started looking in the water with a microscope and like, huh. <laughs> Um, these are just some initial sketches, right? Um, but these transformational sketches of what, the, what these animals and life looks like on these teeny tiny scales were just amazing, right? Imagine being the first person to look through a microscope and to see that this was the world that existed on the microscopic scale. We take this kind of thing for granted today. But people at this time had no idea that this is what things were like on small scales. Now, some of the big questions that had been lingering with biology for a long time, the sort of understanding of, of animals and plants, uh, one of them was heredity. Okay, so this is, this is something that people sort of had struggled with for a long time. Right? It was sort of a basic fact. It's obvious right, that traits are inherited. You look like your parents in some ways. Okay? Um, but basically, it's the, you know, heredity is you take characteristics of the parents, they're, they're transferred to their offspring in one way, one or another ways, and, and we don't know how, so we didn't, people didn't understand how. And so one of the ideas which you had sort of this blending inheritance, which is kind of a natural thing. You sort of see yourself as sort of a mix of your parents, right? So both parents, for example, mix together, and eventually they kind of average out, and you turn into sort of an average of your mother and your father. Um, or you have acquired inheritance, right? Um, you have individual traits that were actually enhanced by your parents. Um, that, uh, you know, that, that was an idea that had been around for a while. Um, and then there's some other sort of more crazy ideas that I, I don't want to spend too much time on. But one of the craziest ideas that actually lasted for a long time is this idea of the homunculus model. So homunculus was this idea of, of how human sexual reproduction went on. Um, and so at this, at this point, you know, people were, they knew about sperm because they could look at things under the microscope. Um, and they see this little head of the sperm. And there was this idea, okay, that there was a complete little human ball, balled up in the head of the sperm, okay, called the homunculus, okay. And, uh, and so the idea was then you just have these little people and the little people go inside the egg and eventually get nurtured until they come out as a baby. Okay? This idea was like, you know, people took, some people took this seriously. So one of the problems with this is, of course, right away, okay, this is probably a man's idea because, like, you know, you kind of, you, people look like their mothers, too, right? It's not just like you only look like your father, okay? And that's where the homunculus is supposed to come from. Okay, so that's kind of weird. doesn't make any sense. The other problem is, is it's totally, you get this problem of infinite regress. And what I mean by that is, okay, so you've got humunculi and sperm. That goes and makes a baby. Let's say it's a boy baby that has sperm. 
They're, therefore, that thing has like, that baby has like thousands of homunculi. But therefore, inside that homunculi, right, all the ones that are going to be boys are also going to have thousands of homunculi, right? And so you have this problem there. Either at some point you're going to run out of homunculi and there's going to be no more babies born, or this just doesn't make any sense. So at some level, this is like this sort of a non-starter from the beginning. But just to sort of think about some of the crazy ideas that people were throwing out just because they so poorly understood these sort of basic things. Um, now, a little less ridiculous, you know, we come to the this sort of classic Gregor Mendel experiments, um, who did these sort of really fundamental experiments to understand the basics of heredity. Okay, um, he was playing with garden peas. And he was doing these really careful experiments with garden peas to understand uh, how heredity from each parent were spread to the offspring. Okay, and one thing he realized is that in many cases there was one factor that was dominant, and one factor that was recessive. So it's almost like they came in pairs, and these pairs sort of created statistics for the outcome. Okay. So for example, imagine you have, um, you have flowers, and some flowers are purple, and some flowers are white. The way to understand this, uh, as you could think of them, is having two sort of pairs of traits. A purple purple, and a white white, for example. All right. So white flowers, it turns out, white is recessive. And what that means is, in order to be a white flower, you better have two white characteristics. Okay? So you, have, you better have white, white pairs. To be a purple flower, the dominant trait, you could have purple, purple, or purple, white, or white, purple. You still turn out being purple. Okay? But you can imagine doing experiments with brood, breeding to figure this out. And this is basically what Mendel did. But what he found is that when he isolated objects that were plants that, for example, purple, purple with a pair of dominant traits and mated them with a plant that had two recessive plates, uh, traits, you found that probabilistically you would always get purple in the end. Didn't matter what happened, if you had a dominant uh, purple combining with a white, you always got purple, no matter what happened. But Underlying this, based on sort of his sort of statistics of doing this experiment, he had figured out that underlying this, what was really going on is you were just doing, you're taking one from each parent, which meant you had purple white, purple white, purple white, purple white. If you had four offspring. Now, if you brought in another purple white and mated them, the outcome could be different. Now you're, you're mating two purples. And so you might naively think, well, the, the child is going to be purple. But that's not what always happens. 25% of the time, you get a white flower. So we now understand this because we understand underlying all of this, you just sort of are matching white with white and pink with pink. Uh, this purple, I guess, is what I'm going with. But anyway, uh, you can envision figuring all this out statistically. Okay, if you do this enough time, you could say, oh, well, 25% of the time I get this when I do this kind of pairing, but when I do that kind of pairing, 100% of the time, it's always purple. So if you do enough of these experiments, they, people began to get a sense that there was something unseen. There was some agent in there that was carrying these kind of characteristics forward. And then the question began, well, what is this thing? What is this agent that's carrying heredity forward? If we could understand that, you know, we could understand sort of the basics of what's defining characteristics of life. The next big step here came from microscopic experiments. So these experiments with, the, you know, Mendel was doing was just sort of with plants doing statistics. But um, Oscar Hurt Hurtwig did a series of experiments using sea urchins. Now sea urchins have this uh, amazing characteristic that they have gigantic egg cells. And so you, even with early type microscopes, you could look inside those eggs, egg cells and see what was going on. Okay. So what uh, he was doing was looking at sperm and egg fusion inside sea urchins. Um, and what he realized then was that there was a role for both the sperm and the egg. 
Okay? To, to us, that just sounds so obvious, right? It's sort of ingrained in us that this is how reproduction works, but at this time, not so, right? They were talking about homunculi and whatever. You know, they, they didn't know how things worked. But his point was that hereditary factors reside in the cell nucleus. So here's the egg cell, there's the nucleus. The sperm goes into the nucleus, and that's, that's sort of where the information is. Something important is happening in the nucleus of the cell, not just the rest of the cell. The next big step came as microscopes got even more powerful. And also, as people began to develop chemical dyes that could make parts of that nucleus stand out and pop out in color so you could see them more easily while you were watching what was going on. Okay? So Walter Fleming in the late 1800s had developed dyes that made the thread-like structures that seemed to exist in the cores of uh, in the nuclei of cells pop out. Um, and therefore, they, they began to carry these colors from the dyes. And because they carried these colors, people started calling them chromosomes. Um, he could watch skin cells divide and other kinds of cells divide. So if you take some living material, watch it under a microscope, you could see that the living material, the cells themselves, would, would divide and create two new cells. Okay? Um, and what the chromosomes would do is they would divide, and then they would replicate, and then they'd split into two. And there's a process by which there were some function going on in the cell would allow those chromosomes to create new chromosomes and divide and create new cells that apparently it was cop there was a mechanism going on inside the cell that was allowing them to sort of make copies of themselves. And it began, this process itself began to be associated with life. He named the process of division mitosis, which is what we call it today. And he knew that these chromosomes were playing a key role in this mitosis, this division. Um, now what he didn't know was that the hereditary factors that had been discussed by Mendel, right, eye color, stuff like that, was carried inside of these chromosomes. He didn't know that, but people sort of had the idea that maybe that's what's going on. So a really interesting, probably a very important sort of last experiment that I'm going to talk about uh, is sort of getting to the gist, the sort of key insight that allowed us to sort of infer that these hereditary factors were actually being carried by the chromosomes. Um, he was breeding fruit, fruit flies. So fruit flies uh, have very short lifespans. They breed often, and they're great. So you have many, many, many generations that you can study, right? And so he was looking at these fruit flies, trying to understand heredity. Um, and it was with these series of experiments that Tom, Thomas Hunt used to reveal that the, the chromosomes were the site of these hereditary factors that we now call genes. So this is how this works. So it's a little bit, this sort of slide is a little wordy. Um, you can download it a little later today and you can read it carefully. So you know, don't worry about scribbling everything down. This is all going to be on the, on the notes that you can grab. But, so here's the basic point. Fruit flies normally have red eyes. Okay, take your typical fruit fly, it's going to have red eyes. But every now and then, they have white eyes, but it's only the males that have white eyes. You never have female fruit flies with white eyes. With, it's, only, it's only the males, and it's pretty rare when it happens. Okay? So, um, so they began to suspect that whatever agent in the chromosome told the fly whether to be male or female also told it what kind of eyes it could have. Okay? Um, So just to sort of break this down a little bit, male flies inherit male characteristics by virtue of, herit of inher the, sorry, the hypothesis was, there was a hypothesis that they were trying to test. The hypothesis they were trying to test was that male flies always inherit male characteristics by virtue of inheriting the male chromosome. And they called that chromosome Y. Uh, 
Female flies always inherit a female chromosome, which we'll call X, which we all call X now. This was a hypothesis. Okay. Thousands and thousands of matings convinced Morgan that the wide eyes were clearly a characteristic associated only with that Y chromosome. Okay? That was his idea. He said, boy, you know. So people understand the So this is the hypothesis. I didn't know for sure this was what was going on. A breakthrough came when Morgan found a rare female fly that had white, that had white eyes. This is weird. What's going on there? His wife, Lillian Morgan, said, hey, you should look and see if that fly has unusual chromosomes. Maybe it's sort of an unusual female. Maybe if you look closely at her chromosomes, you'll see something that's different. And he did just that. And what he found was that this fly had an extra chromosome. She was XXY. And that was basically the clincher, right? It was sort of like, OK, this Y, the Y must carry the white eye gene. And this was really important. And it sort of was one of the big major steps that made it clear that these chromosomes were the things that were carrying hereditary traits. And today, there's a lot of evidence, obviously, that the chromosomes carry hereditary traits. But it's important to remind ourselves about these sort of basic steps that led to these understandings. And it's, and it's many, many stories that go just like this, right, that we've put together. So that when you get sort of the textbook answer today of like, this is how DNA works, and this is how chromosome works, it comes from many, many thousands of anecdotes like this of individual investigators and labs, many of which we probably don't even, haven't even recorded, that have come together to, you know, to give the story that we have now. Of course, the last sort of big breakthrough in this story was with the discovery of that uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, can store and replicate information and effectively be, uh, that, 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 that sort of be these genes that we're talking about. I'll return to DNA later, the discovery of DNA and the different people who played roles in that uh, later in the course. But I just wanted to mention it. And I'll flash the final slide as you guys pack up. Um, as you're walking out, let me just say, the essential point here, right, is that biology is governed by physics. Fundamentally, it's a physical process that governs biology, as we understand it now. And it's not sort of this mon you know, magical, spontaneous generation. And by realizing that and understanding methodically about how this thing progresses, we can now start you know, revisiting questions of like, well, then how did life begin? And what conditions did it take for life to begin? Okay, thanks. <laughs>